A new study about napping that sort of woke us up, you could say. It finds that one third of Americans actually nap during the day. And if you're saying I can't because I'm at work, our Stephanie Sai might just provide you with an excuse tonight. From presidents to those trying to listen to them, there's not a national stage important enough, not a live television audience big enough to wake us up. It's because we're so exhausted. We have a nation of walking zombies. Uh, George. Naps, especially on the job, get a bad rap on TV. Morning, Mr. Wilhelm. But research shows that George Costanza has the right idea. Where's Costanza? If we can only take that 10 to 15 minutes and respect that period, we will be much more productive, much more efficient, much more effective. At Yard Metals, the company enforces a need to nap policy and provides a fully equipped nap room. The company says naps can even improve safety for employees that operate heavy machinery. For those that don't have the luxury of a napping nook, YouTube abounds with videos of workers catching their Z's at their desks, <laughs> even in bathrooms. Wake up, Homer. Hey, boss. Huh? What? You're fired. Hey, what? For sleeping on the job. Assuming you don't fall asleep at the controls of a nuclear power plant, a short snooze can go a long way. Albert Einstein, Winston Churchill, and Thomas Edison, all regular nappers. So is the CFO. I'm definitely recharged after. I fully endorse it and I love it. I look forward to it. I tried it myself, in the interest of research, of course, hoping I too might slumber my way to success. Stephanie Sai, ABC News, New York. She's still sleeping, and note to self, not at the nuclear power plant. Good luck with the boss tomorrow on that one. Friend John Quinones, what would you do? Imagine this, you buy a new home, and in the garage you find a cubby hole, and in it, $45,000. It happened to Josh Farron, an artist in Utah. He returned all of it to the previous owners, saying he wanted to teach his boys to do the right thing. Now to another remarkable image tonight, Tiffany Goodwin with her baby in one hand, catching a foul ball with the other, snatching it over the head of her husband. And she told me today it happened last week too. You not only catch one last week, you catch one this week while you're holding the baby. Correct. So have you heard from recruiters yet? <laughs> no, but the, uh, the ushers there at Richmond were asking if I could uh, sign up, and I told them it was a package deal. The baby and I had to go together. Baby Jerry comes along too. That's right. Love it. And baby Jerry, by the way, is just fine. That helmet has nothing to do with mom who catches all of those balls. We have the story of another beloved manager. This week, when the Giants won their first World Series since moving to San Francisco, the father figure to an entire team finally got the win he waited more than 50 years for. Here it is. Struck him out. You might have seen Brian Wilson's winning pitch. The Giants are world champions. Or his teammate, Tim Lincecum, climbing the fence to celebrate the Giants' win. But unless you were watching the World Series really, really closely, you probably never saw our person of the week. There he is, hugging MVP Edgar Entery. Mike Murphy has been with this team from the very beginning. I started working for the Giants in 1958 as a bad boy. Right after the Giants moved from New York to San Francisco. And in 52 years, he has never missed a home game. Hello. Murph, as he's known, is the clubhouse manager okay, for the ready? Giants. In a clubhouse named after him. He's been to the World Series four times. There was 1962. The Yankee big guns sink the Giants. There was this game 40 years later. The Angels, world champions. And who could forget 1989, the Giants versus the A's, game three. Interrupted by that 6.9 earthquake. But finally, there was Monday's game. And they did. And there was a phone call. After the Giants won, I called Willie Mays and told him, hey, Willie, I'm on top of the world. I said, this is for you and I. Willie's been like a dad. We've been through together a lot of times. And if Mays has been a father figure to Murph, it's obvious right that he's been the father Andre figure Torres. to his players. You're the best. You are the best. He's you, the best. No, he's you are. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, yeah. And huh? what's next for Murphy? Well, uh, old timers say, hey, Murph, what'd you tell us when you, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Hey, I was here when you got here. I'll be here when you're gone. And so we choose Mike Murphy, supporting his team for more than half a century, and he'll be back with them next season. Congratulations to Murph, the Giants, and all the fans in San Francisco.
It's been said, what we do for ourselves dies with us. What we do for others lives on. Powerful words, especially when you see this tonight. What one man and his family did for four strangers. Tonight, we team up with Jeremy Schapp from ESPN's E60 for our Persons of the Week. Philadelphia, November 20th, 2009. 25-year-old Francisco Paco Rodriguez, an amateur champion from Chicago, a husband and father, has earned his first title shot as a pro. But by the 10th round, Paco's defenseless and the fight is stopped. He retreats to his corner. I noticed his eyes rolled back. And I just kept screaming at him. And he wouldn't answer. His brain swelling and bleeding, Paco undergoes three hours of emergency surgery. His wife, Sonia, rushes to the hospital. What did the doctors tell you? They said, we're sorry, but there's no possibility of him making it. Two nights after collapsing in the ring, Paco Rodriguez is declared brain dead. Three hours later, the Gift of Life donor program approaches his family about donating his organs. I would think it would be very disappointing to see that all the hard work that Paco did to keep his body in the shape that he kept it, his heart to let it stop beating, I think it should give someone else a chance. Paco, Paco, Paco. Over the next two days, Paco would help save the lives of four women. His heart went to Alexis Sloan a boxing fan who'd been born with a genetic heart condition. Ashley Owens was losing her lifelong struggle against cystic fibrosis until surgeons replaced her lungs with Paco's. Paco's liver went to Megan Kingsley, once an accomplished swimmer, but after nine years of constant illness, she had had perhaps days to live. And Vicki Davis, a 57-year-old mother of two, received one of Paco's kidneys and his pancreas. With the assistance of Gift of Life and ESPN, the four recipients flew to Chicago to meet Paco's family. Paco's 17-month-old daughter, Jeanette, felt her father's heartbeat. And there was Megan's mother, Sharon, so indebted to Paco's mother. Mother to another mother. I know, but I thank you for the gift that you gave us. Without him, she wouldn't be alive either. It's hard to accept that he's gone, but because of him, other people live, and he lives within them too. A piece of him is still there, so that makes me happy. And so we choose Paco Rodriguez and his brave family for their gift of life. Tonight here, the story behind a tearful tribute today in Maine. A mother and father remembering their son and two Marines remembering the comrade who saved their lives by giving up his own. It was April 14, 2004. Marine Corporal Jason Dunham and his team were trying to flush out Iraqi insurgents after an ambush. As Dunham began searching a row of vehicles, one of the drivers jumped out and attacked him. Corporal Kelly Miller and Sergeant William Hampton ran to help. The first thing both of us did at the exact same time was focus on Jason and start running towards him. But Dunham cried out, no, no, watch his hand. The insurgent was holding a grenade. Everything from there was pure instinct. His instinct was to protect us. Corporal Dunham threw his Kevlar helmet and his body onto that grenade to save his comrades. It exploded. He died eight days later. Dunham was the first Marine since Vietnam to receive the Medal of Honor. And today his parents, Dan and Deb Dunham, looked on as the Navy's newest destroyer was named in his honor, the USS Jason Dunham. It will sail the oceans of the world on wings of an angel. His mother, holding back tears, christened the warship. His father told us his son's name will now live on as a reminder of his courage and of what the military does every day. I'm a better person just because Jason was my son. His mother said, as they grow up, you try to encourage your children to do the right thing, telling us she's now the mother of a son who did. As a mom, I'm having a hard time because my son's not here. But what I hope it represents is, is that when his ship is in sail, people see his name and 
and maybe somebody will look it up. And when they do, the story they'll find is one of sacrifice and valor, the kind his two comrades say they are grateful for every single day. Bottom line is you did whatever you needed to do to make sure we came home to see our families, and we're greatly, greatly thankful for that. It brings a lot of closure. It, I don't think for either one of us or his family, you know, I don't think it'll ever be enough. I mean, he's a great man. He's a great Marine. The USS Jason Dunham is the first Navy warship named after one of the fallen from Iraq. That is the broadcast for tonight. I'm David Muir. I hope to see you back here tomorrow night. From all of us here at ABC News, thanks for watching. Good night.